and welcome to another episode of What Are You Selling? with me, David Green. And joining me today is the author of Disrupting Destiny, and she has a brand new book out very, very soon, in the February. Because this one, this episode, you should be listening to this one at the beginning of February. So perfect timing. It is Jan Foster. How are you doing? Hi, today? Hi I'm all right. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. So we were having a good chat before. Um, so my background is breaking as it usually does. I have to try and sit still. I just move around too much when I talk. I, just, I, I, can't, I can't help it. I'm, um, I'm a bit expressive as well. Sorry, I'm, I'm <laughs> sitting on my hands so I don't wave right. around too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I just do it. I, I feel like I have to make, because we were talking about this before about accents. I feel like I have to make up for my really boring, monotone, Mancunian accent, which which we have. Like, you know, people from my, but then, People from other parts of like in an island where I live now or America, they're all like, your accent is so unusual. It's so like, you know, and I'm like, it's really boring. <laughs> <laughs> it's not boring to me. No, but I do get, I went to America and, and people, oh, you're a Brit, you're a Brit. And I'm like, yes, I love your accent. Yeah, I can't help it. <laughs> it's just the way that I talk. Just what I have. Um, yeah, it's a kind of a, it's a strange one, and I, I don't know about you because I mean, obviously, you um, we were talking, say we were talking before we went on, and we grew up. Well, you're living quite close to where I grew up, and I, I've worked absolutely, yeah. Um, and um, when I came over to Ireland to live permanently, because I used to come here when I was was a kid, I used to like come here for six for like the summer holidays and Christmas holidays, and I go back to to school in England and what have you. Um, but I came, when I came back to move over here permanently, I think my accent has become stronger for some reason. I don't know why, because I didn't use oh. the an accent. I used to just think that it sounded just like normal. And I was like, I don't have, I, you know, I'd, I'd, hear, I'd hear other people, I'd think, wow, they've got a really strong accent, you know? And I'd just, in my own ears, I'd be like, it's just got a bland voice, really. It doesn't sound like anything. you don't have to me you don't have that strong an accent but then I do hear a lot of very very Mancunian people and, and yours is subtle but it's it is there it is definitely it is, there uh, <laughs> it's, it's not Liam and Noel Gallagher anyway oh. well you know <laughs> they, they don't really have that accent well Noel doesn't anymore anyway he pretends he pretends he's from Manchester he's really... so it's all the PR that's what they do they get trained in how to speak so that people can actually understand them Exactly, yeah, exactly. It's like, I don't know, we're going well off topic of books here now, but I don't know if you were watching the Prime Minister's Question Times the other day. I don't really watch it that often, like pretty much never. But, you know, the new speaker of Thingyo is like proper northern fella. And he's like, if you don't yeah. stop talking over there. <laughs> and I was like, right. yeah, going, man, this is so funny because everyone else is so, is so posh. And then there's like the Scottish fella who keeps getting up and talking <laughs> and speaking. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so out of place but anyway <laughs> uh thanks so much for coming on uh and talking to us about yourself and and the books that you've got because i mean you have obviously we talked about just as you came on that you've got a new book coming out pretty soon which is part of your series but you just tell me as well that you also do uh, you have a children's book as well I do, yeah. <laughs> I, I normally come onto these things and talk about the uh, the adult novels that I've got, but yeah, I do have a children's book, and that was uh, was actually the first book I published, oh, yeah. and it's uh, a new experiences one for. Well, it's been specifically designed to be attractive to children who may be on the cusp of dyslexia. So it's written in dyslexia font, it's with a comic book style, and it features sort of cartoon esque characters. And it's a first experiences series. So in this, the first of the books, obviously it's about a uh, first swimming lesson. And right. my two characters, Mitch and Mooch, have to get ready for the lesson. They have to buy swimming costumes. And then it's, it's kind of just teaching them what to expect. But of course, once you've done all of that and the swimming lesson's in progress, then it all has to go horribly wrong because you know <laughs> how do you deal you're trying to trying to empower children to think about what might happen and what their strategies might be for dealing with the unexpected okay. uh, in this case there's a, an unexpected pirate who can't swim so yeah there's a, that's there's a, a whole story happy. yeah that's a real it's, it's a fun book isn't it yeah you know, that's great are we because i have um I have a book, not for not for me, obviously. I, I can I've been swimming for a long time. Um, but uh my, my son is just turned four, he's autistic. So um, we have a lot of oh, well it's it has it's been um it's been tailored specifically to help children who might be on the spectrum with right. 
it's just introducing them. I, I don't know about you, but do you find that your child is a bit resistant to new experiences? Sometimes. I mean, he's he's uh, he's he's uh, very high functioning, which is which is right. you know, very very blessed to have that because obviously it can be a variation of things. Um, yeah. What he can be sometimes, because because what we kind of have noticed that with him as well, he gets very anxious about stuff because um, he yeah. thinks about yeah. that a lot, and he, and he you know he, he starts trying to think and think and think and think about these things. Yeah, so, it's, it's the unknown, isn't it? That's yeah, 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 it's yeah. out of their control. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. I, I actually I, I did <laughs> develop the book with with um with a, a a group of parents of autistic children, um to make sure that I was. Kind of pitching it at exactly the right level to support those children and obviously to support the parents that uh, are trying to perhaps bring their child to something that can very traditionally be seen as a really scary activity for, yeah. for children on the spectrum so um yeah it was it was done in in association with with a lot of parents from, from that yeah it's brilliant <laughs> because they're really helpful those kind of books because it's as you say you know uh, they're entertaining as well they have a good message in them but it has this yeah. thing where it's like this is what you can expect this is what we will do yeah. and this and this and this and obviously um yeah for, for for him he like really responds well to that kind of thing and he, and he loves swimming like we just we went today like we, we go swimming two or three times a week and he loves being in the water and everything but yeah, when when you uh, <laughs> when uh, when I was trying to say to him, you know, you, maybe you'd like to go and have lessons from. There's a lady here that comes and does lessons, and he was like, no, I just like I just want you to do it. That's it. That's it. And yeah. so it was like, well, let's start, we'll have to try and get him to nudge him in this direction a little bit and <laughs> get these kind of things to help him out with. Well, that's brilliant. So so when why did the idea of of doing a children's book, especially your first one as well, where where did that come from? Well, um, when I was on maternity leave from having had my son, I uh, obviously had a couple of years when he was growing up and then he went to school. I still have my young daughter, but I started doing reading with the children in our local school. And because uh, it's quite sort of one to one, um, what part of my job was, was to help kind of support those reluctant readers, should we say. And through doing that for a couple of years, getting to know a couple of the children and then sort of widened that out into reading with perhaps the children that really are struggling and, and perhaps they shouldn't, you know, they weren't keeping up quite as much as, as you would like, as you would hope. Um, so it, it came to me really as an idea and as a concept when I looked at more extracurricular stuff and talked to them about trying, it's when you try and pick a book with a child and you say, well, what do you like doing out of school? What might interest yeah. you? And um, it struck me that a lot of children actually didn't do very much sport. Right. So I was trying to introduce sport to children, not just the, you know, the, the, the autistic children, but uh, children in general. Um, and there wasn't a huge amount of books that talked about, you know, what to expect if you go to a football lesson, what to expect if you go to a gymnastics lesson or a swimming lesson so that I, I found it really hard how do you how do you how do you talk to a children about a sport when they've never done it and they don't they don't know anything about it and it's not kind of on tv except you see professional footballers but at that level and a lot of a lot of kids want to learn how to play football but it's the fear of not knowing and you know no matter how much a parent tries to encourage the child it's really hard to describe what to expect sometimes so I thought well if I do a series of books where I talk about you know the first time you go to one of these lessons then it might demystify it a bit and that might encourage children to be a bit more active so really? hence the series was born um and unfortunately the the downside was was that I published <laughs> I was set to to publish the Mitch and Mooch Try Swimming um and it was due to publish on the 30th of January and on the 22nd of January, you uh, might recall, but that was when we went into lockdown. Yeah. Boom. No swimming lessons, nothing, yeah. absolutely yeah. nothing. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's been a bit of a slow start <laughs> just because literally there was no pools. Nobody could take their kids swimming anyway. So that just right. kind of yeah. went a bit quiet. And then obviously, as things have opened up again, it's done really well. But um, the problem I've had is that, unfortunately, my... Um, my illustrator was uh, an unfortunate victim, shall we say, of the current situation. So I'm in this position where the second book is kind of partly done, 
but I need to basically start over and, and find a new illustrator and yeah yeah that's, uh, so that's where we're at with that one yeah. so in the meantime I thought oh well I'll write some adult books as well so yeah, because... yeah 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 and, and then that's been going well I mean I I, 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 under, I, I guess that you've been always been writing has been a passion for you or you've been or reading was a passion for you to kind of get into wanting to be yeah writer. yeah reading reading for me um was always a bit of a lifeline to be honest with you uh, particularly with things that I was finding in in the real world I was struggling with I could always retreat into a book mm -hmm. and one of the things that I when I started writing I acknowledged to myself fairly early on was that I wanted to provide an escape because that's what reading was for me it was a way to just kind of shut out everything else that was going on and just get lost in a world, someone else's world, didn't matter who. Um, and it, it made my life a bit easier, not that it was particularly difficult, but, you know, that escape, knowing that I had that escape in a book was, um, was quite important to me. And so I wanted to be able to provide that. So what am I selling? I'm selling an escape <laughs> is, where, um, is where I'm going. Well, that's what we all want. We all want the escape. So um, yeah. well, let's let's get into your book. So you, you mean you're uh, you, there's it's a, it's a at the moment it's a two book series. We have the prequel and we have the uh, the first book in the series, and we have the yes. prequel coming out in February. Yeah. So book one is called Disrupting Destiny. That's right. Um, yes. The uh, thing that really kind of attracted there it is there. It's looking beautiful. Uh, the thing that really <laughs> uh, kind of piqued my interest about this is that it's a Tudor based yeah yeah, which, yeah being in the north of England growing up in the north of England as well you know Speak Hall and all these kind of places that are us around That's the right, country yeah. Uh, yeah yeah we, we there's a lot of like Tudor buildings and, and everything's still around so it's something that we grow up with around us um and it's uh it's amazing and, it, and it's to bring that into a fantasy sort of setting is something that i've never come across before so that's uh that's... i know it is a bit unusual it's it's quite hard to peg as well actually <laughs> it's quite hard to put your little categories on that one yeah. um essentially the world that um is is the natural series is almost like a parallel universe but it's happening simultaneously to events in history so in Disrupting Destiny, it starts in uh, 1536. And yes, there is a specific reason why that year. Um, but hidden amongst the normal human world of England and Scotland, you've got creatures that are living their lives within that world. They're essentially hidden. Um, but Nature itself is a completely separate queendom. Okay. It's actually technically just, uh, or just was born in the Orkney Islands but just to kind of make it a little bit removed. Um, and these creatures are ancient creatures that have been there before mankind. In fact, actually, they used mankind. Uh, sounds horrible thing to say, but um, you discover why more in, in the prequel, which is more of the introduction to yeah. the world. Um, and now their power, if you like, is fading except it isn't. Uh, the phase power is, is very definitely fading and they are struggling as a race. Um, but the vampire's power is on the rise. Um, I, I, I'm worried that I do upset a few people possibly in that my, my vampires are closely allied with the Catholic Church. Um, for for <laughs> bloodletting reasons, let's be honest yeah. here, the vampires are all about keeping a supply of blood and the church was well known for being where you went to receive medical help. And of course, the most common thing that they did was let your blood. Yes. Mm. Yes. How very yeah. handy for a vampire. Yeah, that's, that's great. And, and obviously as well, there were, there were a, a society that was spread across the known world at the time as well. Absolutely. They were the prevalent society. So in, in my, world, my world history, the, uh, the Satian Wars has happened a long time ago and uh, the essentially the vampires have won and right. the Catholic Church has risen with su the support of the vampires. They're, they're living, you know, fairly, fairly openly within the Catholic Church. Okay. Um, but the agreement is, is that they don't make any more vampires because if vampires are eternal, as are Faye, and Faye are just kind of designated to go and live on the fringes of society. Okay. So they, they've kind of retreated to Nature A right. to... Uh, to live out their 
eternal lives very quietly but of course that doesn't happen that doesn't happen at all excellent it sounds it sounds almost blasphemous and i love it i, I, I know I it is it. a little bit i know i'm a bit worried about that but <laughs> so far nobody's come up and said oh you're very it's to be honest with you there is a deeper there is a deeper thought process and discussion going on in the books which is about faith right um, and i spell that with an i and an e faith with an e um in in the world i've created you discover that in risking destiny the humans powered faith and that was given back to them in the form of blessings and that helped their crops to grow and the, the soil was fertile so there was a kind of a, a nice circle of things circles being quite important i used the stone circles in orkney um as a, as a quite a pivotal location in in that book and faith becomes a very, very important thing um, in terms of belief and what do you believe in? Do you believe in yourself? Do you believe in mankind? Do you believe in humanity? Do you believe in a church? Yeah. So there's a, a, a theme running throughout the series that discusses that as well. Nice. It sounds like a really heavy So 15, 1536, no, no spoilers. 1536. No spoilers, but would that be because of the execution of Anne Boleyn? Or... <laughs> oh, well done. You remember your history. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes. Um, but it's more about the schism between the Catholic Church and Henry VIII. Right. Okay. So, um, as you're aware, growing up um, in, in, this, in this country, particularly in this part of the world, uh, the effect of the break from Rome on the common man was actually very very similar if you can uh, remember <laughs> brexit um yeah. it, it was like that you literally had people who were on one side and the other and even within households there was conflict exactly the same as it was in brexit and to be honest with you brexit kind of made me think about when that sort of situation had happened in our country and hence 1536 so running throughout that particular book you do have this conflict where people are not sure where they should um where they should sit in which camp and so they're obviously they've told by the king by parliament you now are church of england you must not have any of this pomp and pageantry of the catholic church which as you can probably imagine is going to lead to problems in the future um you know that's it your life has changed forget everything you thought you knew it's not true it doesn't happen and of course, for the common man, that, that's not true at all. You, you spent your whole life believing in something and believing that, you know, if you if you ate the wafer, then you were eating the body of Christ and you're suddenly told, hang on, no, that doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's crazy to think of what that impact must have been. So I try and talk about the effects of uh, of such a schism, a schism on, on ordinary, on yeah, ordinary people. Idea. I mean, that's the great thing about Brexit, really, was that um, it gave people loads of ideas for things. Because I, 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 my fancy, one of my fancy series, the idea if that came from Brexit as well. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. like more, more in line with like the kind of the xenophobia aspects of it, where people oh, being, mm. like this is this is people being exploited, basically. That was kind of yeah. like the, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm a big history fan. I love history, um, and uh, you know, that's one of the great things about growing up in England is that you're surrounded by so much history everywhere so um have you always obviously you you're very you sound like you obviously know what you're talking about when it comes to history it, you can, I, do, it, I do a lot of research <laughs> yeah uh, are you a big fan of Faye as well was was something was the Faye always something that was um something you're into or was it just fitting nicely with this well where you wanted to it's, it's interesting actually because I didn't and don't read much faith books right. um it literally was a case of i wanted a race that was magical i wanted a race that was going to be coping in a human society with a massive impediment you got wings it's really hard to live with wings <laughs> you know it's, so i wanted to give them a give them a challenge that would make them different because to all intents and purposes, my fate appear human. You know, they look like a human, everything like that, except that they've got wings on the shoulders. So how do you deal with that in a highly religious society? Yeah. Um, so I do not read fey books just simply because I don't want to have traditional norms of fey hierarchy. And I know that there's a, there's a, there is a whole subculture of 
established fae precedents yeah. and i try not to let that influence me so i don't read fae books generally i've read a few since actually since starting and creating my world and now i've got that kind of mapped out i find it easier not to be so influenced yeah, yeah, yeah. um my fae are different to fae that you perhaps might if, you, if you're a fan of fae subculture then um you yeah, mine, mine are not like that. <laughs> well, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's great to put your own spin onto things. Like, I mean, I, I do a bit, I dabble in ghostwriting for, for people. Mm. And I was asked to do a, a Fae story because they saw that on my profile that I was like an Irish based author. So they were like, this person must know about Fae. And I was like, don't really know all that much about Fae, but I'll give it a go. And um, what I did was uh, I just merged Fae with Arthurian legend. And I was like, I'm just going well, to do that. That's it, you see. <laughs> that, that there is legend. And I, and I tried to kind of bring that in. Um, there's an incident in Disrupting Destiny where the main male character has to, got no alternative, he has to show his wings. Um, right. And he has to fly carrying somebody because, you know, that's part of the story was what happened mm -hmm. and he has to expose himself to humans which normally wouldn't obviously do uh, and he comes away with a, a wonderful explanation uh, just to kind of swagger it out if you like of oh yeah I'm an angel yeah we, we exist we exist yeah you, you're right but don't sh don't tell anybody kind of thing right. because they genuinely did believe they genuinely believed that there were angels and these people were amazed and mystified and oh okay great that just confirms my belief brilliant there you go so <laughs> no, that's really good it's clever so uh book one is out prequel is out and we've got yep. book two coming out at the end of february uh that's right yeah. Destiny. so tell us a little bit about that um tinkering slightly more with the alternative history side of things there um the next book takes place 20, 17 years later so it's 1553 and um, it's uh, obviously having had things nicely resolved in Disrupting Destiny at the end, because you need a kind of happy ever after, don't you really? Uh, we, we jump forward 17 years to what's actually happening and, and the problems that the Nature King and Queen, well, Prince and Queen are facing with running a realm, running a realm. They're struggling to get back on their feet and, and they're kind of making it. Unfortunately, what was also happening in England is that uh, 17 years ago, when Henry Fitzroy, who was the bastard son of Henry VIII, died, he didn't die. He was made a vampire and right. he's been kept captive, um, waiting for his moment, waiting for his time to take the throne, because that's what he'd always been promised. In fact, real life, he was. Right. Um, so assuming and working on the premise that okay what happened if he didn't die what would have happened so anarchic destiny basically starts with henry being told oh right um you're not actually going to be king i know you've been kept here in chester for 17 years waiting for your time you're not it's not going to happen sorry <laughs> um so we start the book with him literally having his entire purpose for being and purpose for being made vampire totally ripped away from him so he's left kind of wondering what what the hell do I do uh who am I I can I can do anything I want now what do I want to do so his journey is very much one of discovery and through that we discover what it's like to be a vampire in my world um but that that contrasts quite a lot with what happens in nature where things are falling apart they are not going as well as they could uh, there's an heir issue, uh, Aoife, the Queen, can't make an heir, no matter what she need, what she did. So, hmm, funny, does that sound a bit like Henry? Yes. So, she, um, she makes a pretty drastic decision about how to solve her problem as she sees it, without really taking into account um, other people's views on the matter, particularly her husband's, which is <laughs> yeah, a bit of a problem. Right. So, yeah. It all kind of gets a bit chaotic, really, because Henry does finally uh, realise what he wants, and he tries lots of different things to get into power and subvert whoever is in power at the time, which is actually Queen Mary, his half sister. So he's he's going to try and uh, infiltrate the English court 
but that doesn't work. Well, so you know, it was, some chaos. Yeah, I mean, 1553 was quite a crazy year as, uh, in terms of... Oh, absolutely gambling. bonkers, yeah. <laughs> Uh, if you're very good at picking years, so uh, uh, yeah, this is this sounds definitely something that is right up my alley, though, which I will be checking out. All right. Yeah. What is next for the series? How how many books do you envision in this series? There's series. Um, um, sorry. An, another few key years that I need to kind of, right. <laughs> kind of cover. Um, they're also kind of centering on each of the each of the four types of creatures. So. Anarchic destiny, actually, you really see not just the rise of a vampire, a vampire in particular, um, but you're also seeing the rise of the demons who are essentially chaos bringers. So that's anarchic destiny. The next book is going to be looking very much at witches um, because they're, we're getting into witch hunting time here. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you've also got the rise of Elizabeth I. So she's, she's going to come to the throne. Um, and that's book three. Okay. And then book four will be uh, where it all kind of goes a bit wrong. It covers the whole century of the, the series with, with key years and pivotal things happening, obviously. But you are talking about eternal people. So uh, it, it kind of <laughs> it doesn't matter. Nobody really gets old in my world, <laughs> except for the humans, of course. So that's <laughs> that's handy. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we've, so we've got which which is uh, taking the, the center stage really in book three and then in book four we're looking at really the civil war period so we're talking about a clash it's building up to a big war and that war will also be happening with mankind as well right. uh, in the civil war yes so, yeah. uh, our friend oliver cromwell may well be making Absolutely. appearance at some point now. well I am, you never know yeah i like to i, I don't i don't like books which a kind of set in a human court with yeah. that um because you you have to be so accurate and people get really yeah. really upset with you if you are not spot on accurate so where where my characters do have uh, interactions with real life humans i've got it as accurate as i can and actually it was one of the biggest thrills for writing an arctic destiny was i actually found the uh diary of one of the guards at the tower of london um, who had literally written eyewitness accounts of the comings and goings of people in the Tower of London, including Lady Jane Grey. So we've got her execution covered, um, including what he, you know, things like the coronation of Mary I, what she wore, what she drove, uh, you know, what, what the carriage was. <laughs> Unbelievable, you know, from the horse's mouth evidence. So that was really exciting. Um, and there's another incident as well with, uh, with the rebellion in there again actual word of mouth um eyewitness accounts of what happened so yeah I like I like being historically accurate where I can but things like heading into actual court I sort of feel like it's just pushing it a little bit too much yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah I think it's well, hard you, I mean and the thing is with people like Cromwell or other people like, who are you know generally not very well liked in history mm. uh, you can take some artistic liberty with them and people won't really mind no. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I kind of have in that Henry Fitzroy still lives, and that's, yeah. <laughs> that's as much artistic liberty as I feel like I can. It's funny because yeah. I'm actually look, um, in the middle of co-authoring a historical fiction as well, um, and I'm having to be absolutely spot on accurate with absolutely everything in that, down to what do the French call toilets at that particular moment in time? It's really quite kind of yeah. like, oh, right, okay, there's no license here whatsoever. <laughs> Somebody will pick it up if you're not spot on. Yes, it will. It definitely a different will. challenge. Yes, definitely, definitely. Well, this has been this has been great. Um, we've gone well over the time, but that's great. Oh, well. it's been such an enjoyable interview. Love talking to you. Um, you'll have to come back on uh, later on in the year when you when the next book in the series is going to be coming out as well. We can we can catch you. Up I'd love out. to. Thank you very much. It's been really yeah. fun talking to you too. No problem. At all. and for everyone that's uh, watched with us till the end, thank you for staying with us. And until next time, bye bye. Bye.